I could still lose my soul. There's a great example of this in Acts chapter 8. Remember Simon the sorcerer? He wanted to buy the ability to pass on the Holy Spirit. His, his old life was creeping back in again. And Peter says to him in Acts chapter 8 and verse 22, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray to God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. He's a Christian. Repentance is important before you become a Christian. Repentance is important after you become a Christian. But brethren, sadly, I believe that many people do not properly understand repentance. I grew up in the Lord's Church, and I was baptized at a very young age. And for a few years, I was very, very faithful. But then I got into my late teens, and I got into my early 20s, and, and I ceased to be faithful. I would still come to church. I would still attend. But to be honest, that, that's about all I did. I kind of, I'd go through the motions because I wanted to give off the impression that I was faithful. But I never studied my Bible. I never tried to teach anybody. I put, I put a little bit in the plate, but for appearance sake, it certainly was not as I was prospering. I'd partake of the Lord's Supper, but I wasn't faithful. In fact, sometimes I wouldn't even attend if I thought I could get away with it people wouldn't notice. I was really putting zero effort into my Christianity. But I did something that was kind of strange. Because I would go to bed at night and I would pray. And I would say, Lord, please forgive me of the sins that I committed today. Now, I really had no intention of stopping these things. I intended tomorrow I'm going to live just like I did today. But somehow it eased my conscience. I got into my early 20s and I joined the military. I was in the Air Force. And I was stationed at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. During that time, I was under the influence of some things in the military life that were really not good. And I lived that way every day. But I would go to bed at night and I would say, Lord, please forgive me of my sins. It made me feel better. And about that time, there was a book that came out in the early 90s called Behold the Pattern. A big, thick, red book. If those of you who can remember back 30 years ago, Brother Goldman Music wrote the book. The last chapter in that book was on the subject of repentance. Even though I wasn't living faithfully, for whatever reason, I started reading the book. I'd read it every night. I'd read a chapter before I went to bed. And I got to that last chapter on repentance, and I realized something. And that is, I really haven't understood repentance. Now, I want you to just put a peg down there because I'm going to come back to that at the end of this lesson. But brethren, I don't believe I'm the only one who's had a problem understanding repentance. Several years ago, I was involved in a gospel meeting down in Pensacola, Florida. And I was visiting with some members of the church, and I got into a conversation with a brother, Christian, deacon at the congregation, and he began to tell me about a particular sin that he had a problem with. And he told me he'd recently been caught doing this. And so he said that he went forward and he made a public statement of repentance. But then he told me that he's continued to engage in this sin. He wasn't going to stop it. But he felt like since he got caught, he needed to say something. And I went away thinking about that. And I thought, you know, this brother doesn't understand repentance. I frequently hear people define repentance this way. They say repentance means to stop sinning. But that's not right. You know, a man could stop sinning without repenting. You know, if a man is, is smoking and his doctor says, if you don't quit smoking, it's going to quit, or kill you, and he could quit smoking, but, but not repent. Sometimes people will say, um, you know, repentance is a 180 degree change in your behavior. A man could change his behavior, but he could do that without repenting toward God. And so let's begin and define repentance. Let's go to the first slide here. I want you to pay special attention to this definition because this is going to serve as the outline for the rest of the lesson tonight. Repentance, by definition, is this. A change of mind produced by godly sorrow that results in a reformation of life. Now, what we're going to do is this. We're going to have five points in this lesson. Each one's going to start with the letter R, and we're going to trace true repentance tonight. All right, let's go to the next slide. The first word is going to be the word 
receive. You can see right where the fly landed there, next to the, to the number one there. The word receive. What do we mean by that? The process of repentance begins when you receive the information that you need to repent. Now, what do I mean by that? Matthew 4, verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How did John begin his preaching? Matthew 3 and 1, those days John the Baptist began to preach, saying, Repent ye, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Ladies and gentlemen, the process of salvation begins with the person receiving the information that he needs to repent. Now you might say, well, of course, John, we understand that. I did a Google search some time back for the word repentance. And the very first page of results had some articles by some denominational preachers, and one of them caught my attention. It was entitled, What Whatever Happened to Repentance? And I thought, hmm, I wonder what that's about. So I started reading it. This denominational preacher wrote, Whatever happened to repentance? You rarely hear the word mentioned in most churches these days. Even in Baptist, Pentecostal, or Evangelical circles, pastors nowadays seldom call for their congregations to sorrow over sin, to mourn and grieve over wounding Christ by their wickedness. Instead, the message we hear from many pulpits today is, just believe, accept Christ, and you'll be saved. And he goes on to argue that in many places today they are teaching, listen, salvation without sorrow. He said they skip right on to how to be saved without first convicting an individual that he's a sinner, without first having godly sorrow. Now, of course this man's mistaken about thinking there's salvation in these denominations. And he's mistaken about what he thinks a person needs to do to be saved. But he makes a good point about repentance. And that is, there is no such thing as salvation without sorrow. Where does that sorrow come from? Brethren, it comes from somebody teaching me that I'm a sinner, that I have done things deserving of hell. It starts with what some people would call negative preaching. We've got to have negative preaching. You know, in Acts chapter 2, how did Peter begin his preaching? When he ended his preaching, the Bible says it pricked their hearts, it cut their hearts. How did he begin his preaching? What was it that cut their hearts? He said to them, you have crucified the Christ. That's negative preaching. Not really, it's positive preaching. But it's what people call negative preaching. It's the kind of preaching that cuts your heart. Ladies and gentlemen, gospel preaching has got to step on toes. Wrong has to be pointed out. People have to be made to feel ashamed of what they have done. How are you going to get a person to repent of stealing? You've got to tell them it's wrong. How are you going to get someone to repent of sex before marriage? You've got to tell them this is wicked. You're going to lose your soul for this. You've got to tell them it's evil. It's sinful. You will lose your soul. And then you tell them about the remedy. Then you tell them about Jesus Christ. Then you tell them how horrible, after you've told them how horrible hell is, then and only then do you tell them that God loves them and Jesus died so that you don't have to go there. You see, there's a process, but we live in a weird world today that we call it this woke generation. People don't want to hear about sin. They don't want to hear negative preaching. They don't want to be told they're wrong. No one wants to be convicted or have their toes stepped on. And if you do that as a preacher, depending on where you are, you're going to get fired because they don't want to hear that. I'm telling you, the whole process starts with this. If we don't do this, this denominational preacher's got something right. And that is, the whole process starts with convicting the heart. Amen. Convicting the person. You've got to receive this information that there's a problem. Alright, let's go to the next slide. After you receive this information, <laughs> it brings remorse. Why? You've been told that you've done wrong and there is a penalty. There are consequences. The result of that is it cuts your heart. Once I receive the news, it creates sorrow. Peter said you crucified the Christ. The Bible says they were cut to the heart. The received information creates remorse in the hearer, sorrow in the hearer. In fact, here's our verse, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. The Bible says, for godly sorrow 
worketh repentance unto salvation, not be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. I want to make three observations about this verse. The first one is this. Sorrow is not repentance. Sometimes people think, well, if you're sorrowful, that's repentance. No. He says that godly sorrow, King James says, worketh repentance. Some versions say sorrow brings repentance. That's what it means. Sorrow is not repentance. Sorrow causes repentance. All right? Here's the second observation. This verse teaches me that there is such a thing as godly sorrow. Peter denied the Lord three times. The rooster crowed. And the Bible says Peter went out and wept bitterly. Matthew 26, 75. Brethren, that was godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is sorrow that says, I am sorry for what I have done. I'm sorry that I sinned against the God of heaven. I'm sorry that I placed my soul in jeopardy. Peter was sorry. He betrayed Jesus, and he went out and he fixed it. The third observation about 2 Corinthians 7.10 is there is also such a thing as worldly sorrow. I mentioned to you the man in Pensacola, Florida. He'd been caught, but he had worldly sorrow. He had sorry that, sorrow that said, I'm sorry that I got caught. I'm sorry that my sin has been made public. And I'm not going to change it, but I'm going to say something. In fact, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm just going to conceal it better in the future, is what he told me. That's worldly sorrow. Judas is an example of worldly sorrow. He was grieved. He felt deep sorrow. He went back and threw the money down. He, he, in fact, he hung himself. He was so sorrowful. But godly sorrow brings repentance. Worldly sorrow brings death. See the difference in the two? Worldly sorrow is sorrow for the wrong reasons. Worldly sorrow is, I'm sorry that I got a speeding ticket and it cost me $100. Not, I'm sorry that I did wrong. Worldly sorrow is, I'm sorry my wife left me for cheating and now i got to be alone. i got to pay out alone. Not, I'm sorry for what I did. Worldly sorrow is, I'm sorry that I'm serving 20 years in prison and marking it off on my calendar day by day, and I've got this sorry life to live. Not, I'm sorry for what I did. There's a difference in these two things. Here's the first point. Receive the information. After you receive it, if you've got godly sorrow, it causes this remorse, this godly remorse. All right, let's go to the next slide. The third one I called a reversal, a reverse in your thinking. It's a change of thinking, a change in mind. This is repentance. Now, this is important that you get this. Notice in the blue, we've got receive in blue, and that's because receiving the information is not repentance, but is necessary to lead you to repentance. Notice that remorse is in blue because remorse is not repentance, but it worketh repentance. It brings you to repentance. The word reversal, the reverse, the change, it's in red because, brethren, this is repentance. Repentance is the change of mind, the reversal in your thinking. I don't think the same way anymore. That is, I've received this information. I'm so saddened. I'm so troubled. I'm so grieved that I changed my mind, and I think it's going to be different from now on. I'm not going to live that way anymore. Listen to the definition of repentance. Uh, go to the next slide. It is a change of mind. Where did that come from? Produced by godly sorrow, and we're going to notice the next point in a minute, that results in a reformation of life. Repentance takes, I always point at the head, repentance takes place in the head. It is a change of mind. Repentance is not the reformation of life. The reformation of life comes as a result of the change of mind, which the Bible defines as repentance. Now somebody says, Don, I, I think you're split hairs. I, I kind of disagree with you. Listen to this definition given by Jesus. Matthew 21, 28, Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and he said, son, go and work today in my vineyard. And his son answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and said, and then he went. See the distinction? He repented, and then he went. When he went, that wasn't repentance. That was the result of repentance. Repentance is when he changed his mind. That is, I'm sorry, I should have listened to my dad. He repented in his mind, and as a result of that, he changed his life. Brother Marshall Keeble 
gave a good definition of repentance, if I can get the story correctly. It was something like this. He said on one occasion, he went to visit um, some member of the church, and he got there, and he said when he arrived, there was a dog in the front porch, and it was starting to growl. And he said he got a little nervous, so he leaned over and he picked up a stick, and the dog saw him pick up the stick, and that dog came running toward him, and Brother Keeble said he took that stick, and he whacked that dog across the head, and he said that dog turned and tucked tail and ran out of there. Brother Keeble said, that's repentance. He said he had a change of mind, and it resulted in a change of life. It's a pretty good definition, really. All right, let's go to the next point. Reformation. See, it's in blue. Because it's not repentance, it follows repentance. So what happens is I receive the information, I experience remorse, I reverse, I change my thinking. At that point, I have repented. But, listen, the Bible says repentance in the mind should result in a change of my life. The Bible calls the reformation of life not repentance, it calls it fruits of repentance. It's like the man in Matthew 21, after he repented, he went. That was the fruit of his repentance. He reformed his life and did what his father asked him to do. Matthew chapter 3, I keep mentioning those days came the, uh, John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In verse 8, the text says this, John said to the Jews, Bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. Bring forth fruit of repentance. So he taught repentance, and then he said, let's see the fruit of your repentance. The word fruit is a Greek word, karpos. It means the result of something. What is the fruit of an apple tree? It's an apple. An apple tree brings forth, produces something, and it is an apple. What is the fruit of repentance? What is the product of that change of mind? The product is a change of life. That's where the 180 degree turn is. We need to stop telling people that repentance is the change of life. That is the fruit of repentance. Yeah. It comes because you changed your mind. Let me give you some examples. Ephesians 4.28, the Bible says, Let him that stole steal no more. If you repent of stealing, the result is, I'm not going to steal anymore. Why? I changed my mind, so I changed my life. I read a story about a man who walked into a church building. And he went up to the preacher and he said, Preacher, I want to become a Christian. He said, the problem is, I've been stealing from my employer. I don't know what to do about it. And the preacher said, how much have you stolen? And he said, I don't know. I haven't really kept track of it. And the preacher said, you think it's been $1,500? And the man said, well, that, that's probably close. And so the preacher said, I tell you what. He said, this year, only still a thousand. Next year, only still five hundred. And if you get caught in the process, just tell him you are in the process of being converted. <laughs> now, why did he say that? He said that to make a point. The Bible says, let him that stole steal no more. The point is, if you change your mind, you're going to change your life. You don't wean yourself off of this. I think, as a matter of fact, sometimes you can tell something about a man's repentance by his reformation of life. Let me tell you what I mean by that. A man says he repents of alcohol, but he keeps a pint in his glove box just in case he changes his mind. He had not really repented. A man repents of gambling, but he keeps that uh, Powerball ticket in his wallet because, you know, they're going to announce it tonight, and you, you never know. That man hasn't really repented. He hadn't really changed his mind. You don't see by his fruit, you can tell about his change of mind. A man repents of smoking, but he keeps that carton in his desk drawer. Might, the urge might get me. A man, how about this? Maybe you've even seen this. A man comes forward on Sunday morning, and he repents because he hasn't been faithful, and he doesn't come back on Sunday night. Yeah. You ever seen that happen before? Does it go through your mind? He didn't really repent. I think sometimes you can tell something about a person's repentance by their change of life, their reformation of life. Repentance is a complete change of mind that results in a reformation of life. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11. 
Paul gives a list of some heinous sins there included are homosexuals and thieves and drunkards. But of course the key verse is verse 11 where he says, after listing this group of people who he says such will not inherit the kingdom of God, then he says in verse 11, and such were some of you. What does that mean? That means that some of the members of the Corinth Church of Christ used to be homosexuals. And they used to be thieves. And they used to be drunkards. What's the difference? They repented and then they changed their lives. They didn't practice homosexuality anymore. They didn't drink anymore. They didn't steal anymore. In fact, one of my favorite verses on repentance comes from the book of Acts. It is a picture example. In Acts chapter 19, the Bible talks about those who practice black magic, black arts. They engaged in, you know, dark arts. And they would buy these books that taught them <laughs> potions and incantations. And books were very expensive back then. Acts 19 to verse 18 says, And many of them who believed, Christians came, and they confessed, and they showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought together their books, and they burned them before all. And I don't know what the modern day value is, but it was worth a lot of money. Now what does that mean? They repented of that, and they had a reformation of life. They said, we won't be needing these books anymore. After I repented, Sherry and I had some things in the house. We had cassette tapes back when we had cassette tapes. That's what we listened to. We had a VHS tapes and you know, some of the music I listened to wasn't really what a Christian should listen to, but we accumulated a lot of that stuff, and I said, we need to get rid of this stuff. And we had the discussion, maybe, maybe we should sell this, and I said, no, we can't sell this stuff. We just got we just got to throw it in the dumpster. And I thought about this. If I can't listen to it, how can I sell it to somebody else and encourage them to listen to it? And I always think about this verse in Acts 19, because the loss of the money didn't matter. The reformation of life is discontinuing your former practices. So if you used to use foul language, you don't talk that way anymore. If you used to cheat on your, your taxes, that's history. You don't do that anymore. If you used to go out after work with the boys and have a few, that's not what you do anymore. Let's go to the last one. Restitution. Now it's in blue because it's not repentance. Like a reformation of life, it follows Repentance. Now, repentance take it, has taken place. You've changed your life. The final part is restitution. Now, first, what is restitution? And secondly, what does it have to do with repentance? Here's the definition of restitution. It's defined this way. Restoring that which belongs to another. Giving back, replacing, and repaying. Simply stated, it means this. If you've taken something from somebody else wrongly, you're going to give it back to them. If you've cheated someone out of money, you're going to pay them back. If you've taken that which doesn't belong to you, you're going to return it. Basically, it means you want to right your wrong. You're trying to undo the bad that you've done. Now, what does it have to do with repentance? And it's the natural response to it. If your heart has been cut, you're sorry that you did it, you wish you hadn't done it. If you can fix it, you're going to do whatever is in your power to fix it. If you truly have godly sorrow, you want to fix this. You are so torn. You're not going to say, well, I stole that money. Boy, I'm torn up, but keep it in the bank. That doesn't make any sense, does it? I had not been <laughs> preaching long. In fact, it was my first preaching job. I was in um, Faith County, Alabama. And I had not been there long. And it was a Friday night. I had worked late. It was time for supper. I went home to eat. And I told Sherry, I don't know, I have to go back tomorrow, Saturday morning, finish my sermon. And so Saturday, I drive to the church building. And we were out there in the country. And when I pulled up to the church building, the doorknob was gone. And I thought, well, that is odd. And so I got out of the car and I walked in. My office was down in the basement. So I started down the stairs. And as I approached my office, my door was laying on the floor. And I thought, my mind's going a thousand miles a minute trying to figure out what in the world's going on. And as I walk over my door, I go in. Computers were, laptops were a brand new thing then. And so I had one, and I was making payments on it. 
and I just started making paint. It was gone. My boom box that I had in my office, it was gone. I started looking around the building, and our audio system was gone. Someone in your office. A couple weeks passed, and the sheriff called us, and they said they pulled a man over, and he still had some of my stuff in the trunk of his car. And another week or so passed, and I got a call from the chaplain. And the chaplain said, uh, Mr. Blackwell, this man says he's sorry, and he wants the right permission to come to your building and to address the congregation and apologize. Would that be okay? I said, well, I have to ask the elders. That's up to them. So I asked the elders, and the elders said, we're not going to allow that because we don't know what that man might say. He can write a letter if he wants to do that. So anyway... <clears throat> So more time passed, I ran into a deputy at a little hamburger joint around there, only restaurant around, and we got to talking, and he said, you know that guy that robbed you? He said, he robbed about 19 churches around here, and he got permission to go speak in every one of them, and every place he spoke dropped the charges, except your congress. He said, had it not been for you <coughs> sticking to the charges, he'd have gotten off scot-free. And I thought, very interesting. But you know what went through my mind when he said he was sorry? You know what I thought? Where's my computer? Where's the offer to pay me back? Why did I think that? It's the natural response to it. If you're sorry for doing it, I should be hearing, I am sorry, how can I pay you back? What arrangements can be made? Why would you think that? We understand that restitution is a natural part of the process. This is not just a a biblical principle, the world understands this. Very interesting, about 20 years passed, and I received a check in the mail one day for thousands of dollars from that guy. He repented. I don't know if he became a Christian. I don't know what happened, but that man came back after all that time of his own accord, and he paid back. You know what went through my mind then? That man had to change my mind. He's had a change of heart. Why? Because his actions showed it. Restitution showed that there was a change of life, and it showed that there's some sorrow there. It's just a natural part. You can't. You would even have to have a Bible verse, and we understand this, right? You know, in, in the old law, Leviticus chapter 6, 1 through 5, it required, if you had stolen something, not only did you have to pay it back, but you had to add one-fifth more to it. That is, you had to pay back not only what you stole, but more than you stole. He said, ah, that's Old Testament. We're, show me in the New Testament restitution. <clears throat> do you remember reading about a man named Zacchaeus? What do you remember about Zacchaeus? Remember that he's short. Unfortunately, I saw all remember about Zacchaeus. He's a short guy. I always liked that about him because I used to be short myself. But unfortunately, we remember that. But he is a great example of restitution. Zacchaeus said to Jesus in Luke chapter 19, Lord, if I have taken anything wrongly from any man by false accusation, this is what he said, I will restore him fourfold. Why did he say that? The law didn't require that. Zacchaeus said, I'm going to make this thing right. This man's heart was tore up and he said, I'm going to fix this. I've sometimes heard Christians say, that was before I became a Christian. I don't have to worry about that. They, they dealt dishonestly with someone. They think they can keep the money. Brethren, repentance, true repentance, is going to motivate you to want to take care of the matter. Now, understand, restitution can't be made for all sins. If I murder somebody, I, I can't fix that. I, I can't bring them back. There's nothing I can do to restore that. But if I've stolen money, I can certainly give it back. If I've gotten into an unscriptural marriage and taken a man's wife, I'm not going to keep her. If I have stolen someone's good reputation because of lying or slander or gossip, I can fix that. Even if I murdered somebody, maybe I can do something. Maybe I can send some money to his children. I don't know. Maybe my heart motivates me to want to do something. Now, at the beginning of this lesson, I started telling you my story. And I said, remember, because I'm going to come back to it. Somebody gave me a copy of this book, Behold the Pattern, and the last chapter was on repentance. 
and I read it, and I realized that what I was doing every day, where I would just live a wicked life, and then I would go to bed and say, Lord, please forgive me, I realized that's not really repentance. And I realized something else. I realized that I was a Christian who was going to hell. And it made me sick to my stomach. And I would go to bed, and the acid would churn in my stomach literally. I couldn't go to sleep. And I would lay there and toss and turn, and I would think, i got to fix this. i got to change. I, got, I, I was having that godly sorrow, but it wasn't working repentance. Because I thought, you know what, if I make these changes, my co-workers are going to think, I'm a nut job. They're going to think, what in the world is going on with him? What Blackwell's lost his mind. And <clears throat> so I, I would say, I just can't do it. And day after day would pass. And after some weeks passed, I thought, I just can't take it anymore. I've got to make things right. And so I did. I went forward, and I repented. And I went back to work. And I started making things right. And you know what they said? This guy's a nut job. What's wrong with this guy? And one of my bosses even said, like, well, I don't know what's going on with you. Because I didn't act like I did. I didn't do what I did. And they could see that there was a difference. And exactly what I feared was exactly what happened. But you know what? I have not looked back or regretted it for one second. I started looking back at things for which I had to make restitution and worked on that for a long time. I would come back and I would think, you know what? I need to take care of this. And, and that was part of my life for a long time. Friends, that was a change of mind that the Bible calls repentance. And it was followed by a change of life. And I've never looked back. I don't believe that I am the only one who hasn't understood repentance. That's why I started including this as part of a gospel meeting. Because it's important before you become a Christian. It's important after you become a Christian. And I'm convinced that if I grew up in the church and I went for years going through the motions, saying, Lord, please forgive me, and I kept living this, the, this, the same way the next day and not really repenting, I'm convinced I'm not the only one. And as I preached it in gospel meetings, I've had people come to me and say, you know, that, that helped me because that, that was me. You, you're describing me. We could have somebody like that here tonight. Maybe you obeyed the gospel sometime back, but maybe not you need to repent. Maybe you need to do it privately and you can fix that between you and God and lay your head on your pillow tonight in peace. Maybe it is something that needs to be taken care of publicly. Maybe part of restitution is coming forward and saying to the brethren, you know this about me and I want to fix this. I've hurt the reputation of the Lord's church and I want to restore this. That's restitution too, you know. Maybe you need to do that tonight. We would be honored if we could go to God and pray on your behalf. You need to obey the gospel tonight by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized. We'd be delighted to assist you. Maybe you say, I don't know what to do. I need to study. We'd be delighted to study with you. Maybe as a child of God, we need to fix and do what I did years ago and have done since then have come forward. You know how hard it is for a gospel preacher to go forward and publicly repent? I do because I've done it. But my soul is more important to me than any embarrassment or anything else. I want to be right with the Lord. Maybe tonight you want to do that. If we can help you, you've got the opportunity at this time. We invite you to come. So together we stand and sing the invitations. Whoa.